Guide to the Cauldron. Yvonne Whiteman. Published October 17, 2015. If you've even heard of the Cauldron, you're in a minority. It has been languishing quietly in print for just a couple of decades. The Cauldron is a collection of 11 books, 6 Egyptian and 5 Celtic, first published in New Zealand in 1994 by the Hope Trust, now dissolved, and the Kuldean Trust, a metaphysical organization based loosely on the original Kuldees or Celtic followers of Christianity brought to southwest Britain by Joseph of Arimathea in the 1st century AD. Over the centuries, everything has conspired to bury the books of the Cauldron, and still does. Try googling Cauldron, and you'll find yourself face to face with a rational wiki website standing guard at the top of the page like Cerberus. Here be dragons, it proclaims, roundly dismissing the book as so much fooey. Before I wade into what is known about these mysterious books, let me state here and now that I consider much of what is written in them to be jaw-dropping, mind-boggling and, for me, life-changing stuff. They speak to me. I think they deserve an airing and that their core value should be taken seriously. Read the Cauldron's underlying story later on in this article and see if you agree. No one knows what the word Cauldron means. It's probably a garbled version of the Welsh word Seelbren, meaning either the name of a village southwest of the Brecon Beacons National Park, or Seelbren Y. Baird, a supposed druidic alphabet allegedly invented by the writer Ilo Morgan, 1747-1826, whose validity has been questioned by scholars. Some have suggested that Ilo Morgan himself forged the Cauldron, but my research says no. And yes, I've visited the village of Seelbren looking for clues to the Cauldron, but so far without success. People also say the Cauldron and its accompanying book The Kaldi, an ancient British term meaning wise strangers, are channeled. Not so, says the Kuldian Trust. The Trust publishes a number of channeled texts, but insists that both the Cauldron and the Kaldi come from another source altogether, they were brought over to New Zealand from the UK as typescripts and set out with an introductory history by an elderly merchant seaman who attended Gore's Eds councils of Welsh or other Celtic bards and druids, belonged to a hermetic organization, and died in the 1990s. A hardback cloth version of the Cauldron is available online direct from Goodies Bookshop in Auckland and via a web link on the Kuldian Trust's website. The advantage of this New Zealand version is that it carries the all-important dedication, foreword, introduction, salutation, and end matter, which can also be read on the website, the downside is that the paragraphs are not numbered, which makes cross-referencing difficult. E-books of the New Zealand Cauldron and Kaldi are also available from the Kuldian Trust website. 1. The Cauldron New Zealand Hardback, Ref. The Kuldian Trust. 2. The Gospel of the Kaldi New Zealand Hardback, Ref. The Kuldian Trust. In 2005 the Cauldron was pirated and published in paperback as a Bible by Your Own World Books in Nevada, USA. Yobooks versions are available online in laminated hardback and paperback and include The Cauldron Bible. 21st Century Master Edition, Complete Edition Egyptian Texts of the Bronze E-Book, The First Six Books Celtic Texts of the Seal Book, The Last Five Books Kindle Edition These paperbacks have numbered paragraphs for easy reference, but do not include the all-important preliminary and end material. Instead, the, the United States publishers have tried to reconstruct the history of the Cauldron text. They think it might have been written in Egyptian Hieratratic script after the exodus of the Jews then translated into Phoenician script and taken to Britain, among other ports of call, on trading ships, from there it would have been rendered into Old Celtic slash Brythonic, then Old English, then Biblical English and on into Modern English. They reckon that the Celtic books were written between 20 and 500 AD. The historical accuracy of their introduction has been questioned. Reading the Cauldron If you were to sit down and read the Cauldron from start to finish, chances are you'd be utterly baffled because what now exists is only a patchwork remnant of the original. Although there is a certain chronological rationale to the order of the books, logically I reckon that the Book of Manuscripts ought to appear before the Book of the Sons of Fire rather than after, its present position is rather confusing. How did so much of the text get lost? Well, according to the introduction, the Colburn manuscripts were salvaged from Glastonbury Abbey at the time of the Great 1184 Fire which destroyed virtually all the buildings and many of its treasures. We are told that the fire was arson intended to destroy the heretical manuscripts in the library, but the Cauldron manuscripts which have been considered heretical on many levels were secretly housed elsewhere at the time and preserved. Jumping forward several hundred years, we know that the manuscripts were looked after by a group called the Cuddians who were descended from a 14th century Scottish community led by a man called John Cuddy. These later Cuddians were traveling smiths and craftsmen, 
sometimes known as Kofarals, who followed the beliefs of those Celtic Kuldis I mentioned earlier, from the Gaelic Kuldic slash Doomsday Book Quidam at Vini Kuldic or certain strangers. At an unknown date some of the manuscripts were transcribed onto metal plates and became known as the Bronze E-Book of Britain, under this title they were written down in book form in the 17th century. The text was modernized in the late 19th slash early 20th century incorporating some salvaged Celtic manuscripts which had not been transcribed onto metal plates, known as the seal book. We also know that for a period of time the cauldron was buried under a stone cairn in the mountains of Wales. During the 1920s and 1930s these books were kept by a little-known religious group. During World War II the books were thrown out as worthless junk, then salvaged. Originally, the introduction tells us, there were five great book boxes containing 132 scrolls and five ring-bound volumes which comprised the Great Book of the Egyptians. But over the centuries many of the books have been lost or destroyed the Lesser Book of the Egyptians, the Book of the Trial of the Great God, the Sacred Register, the Book of Establishment, the Book of Magical Concoctions, the Book of Songs, the Book of Creation and Destruction, and the Book of Tribulation have all gone. The introduction to the Kalbrin states, it has not been easy to reconstitute them the remaining books, even with the assistance of a more knowledgeable co-worker who filled in the few gaps with compatible references to modern works. The introduction goes on to say, every possible fragment has been retained, some of the proper names are spelt wrongly and some of the original correct ones replaced by others, no claim is made regarding historical accuracy, and the biblical form of English has been modernized by one who has no scholarly pretensions whatsoever. Understandably, reading this tale of woe dampened my Colburn enthusiasm considerably for a year or two, it was only when I traveled to Egypt three years ago that gut instinct told me these incredible books had to be genuine and that I must try to authenticate them. Since then I have been researching here, there, and everywhere to find links with other ancient works and locate archaeological and DNA evidence. One or two other enthusiasts have also been researching and having eureka moments so that, bit by bit, the Colburn is emerging as a unique voice from the past. The Underlying Story Beneath its overriding metaphysical texts the Kalbrin carries an underlying story and it's a fascinating one, with its themes of genetics, global catastrophes, and the search for immortality. Below is a rough outline story I have patched together from the various books. Every scrap of information you read has been gleaned from the Egyptian and Celtic books, with brief links in red to a few of the more important discoveries and identifications made since the publication of the Kalbrin in 1994. Another book which came from the same source as the Kalbrin, entitled The Kaldi, Book of the Illuminators having the authority of the Naso Rhines, was published separately in the 1990s and is an unusual gospel of the life of Jesus written by John of Luna. Now to the story that gradually emerges in the Kalbrin, incidentally, no chronological dates are given in the Egyptian books. The Story in the Egyptian Books At the very beginning of human life, different species of men exist in the world. The Book of Origin states that there were two species. The Children of God. They struggled harder were more disciplined, because their forefathers had crossed the great dark void from another unearthly place far distant outer space, and they do not inherit death. A primitive indigenous species called the children of earth, known as yaslings, half-folk, not true men, sons of botas, and kinsfolk to the beasts of the forest. They are also called men of Zumat, meaning they who inherit death descended from a highly developed ape. The Book of Gleanings, set later in time, lists even more species. The Grand Company, who subsequently withdraw in disgust at the behavior of mankind. The Children of God, led by a wise father, who knew truth and lived in the midst of peace and plenty. The Children of Men, a primitive indigenous species who were wild and savage, clothed in the skins of beasts. The Men of Zumat, yeslings, who were even wilder. According to the Kalbrin, the different species should always have stayed separate. Traces of this mating taboo may still exist in India. Priyamoryani, a geneticist at Harvard University, has done DNA research to show that all people in India trace their heritage to two genetic groups, a South Indian group closely related to Andaman Islands people, and an ancestral North Indian group originally from the Near East and Caucasus region. The Near East slash Caucasus area is traditionally associated with the ancient garden land mentioned in the Kalbrin. Could this ancestral group have taken the mating taboo with them when they resettled in, among other places, Northern India? Is India's ancient Varna slash caste system with its Dalit slash untouchables a system with unknown roots over 3,000 years old a trace of the genetic taboo mentioned in the Kalbrin? www.lifscience.com slash 38751 genetic hyphen study hyphen reveals hyphen caste hyphen system hyphen origins comma August 8, 2013. But when, eventually, 
matings start to occur, this is described as the first defilement. Both the children of God and the Aslings fall ill, and a spirit being tells the children of God, the greatest of evils has befallen the race of the children of God. The fetid flow defiling the woman results from the incompatible intermingling, but it is not all, for sicknesses and diseases are also generating from the ferments of the impure implantation. Because you two are now as one the cankerworms of disease and sickness strike both equally. The children of God are then banished from the gardenland and it becomes a desert. The first yesling man to mate with a woman of the children of God dies of his illness, but his lover gives birth to a daughter. This hybrid offspring is described as a cuckoo child. She is an unusual female with long red hair never seen before and she lives by herself in the forest as a sorceress, preferring the company of yeslings. Eventually she marries a great hero of the children of God in the land of Crocassus, the Caucasus. Versions of her story appear in both the Egyptian and the Celtic books. The second defilement happens later when woman is tempted by the strength and wildness of the beast, which dwelled in the forest. We are told that because of the wickedness that was done, there are among men those who are the children of the beast, and they are a different people. Compare with the Aramaic version of the Book of Giants found in Qumran IQ 23 Fragment 1 plus 6, 200 donkeys, 200 asses, 200, rams of the flock, 200 goats, 200, beast of the field from every animal, from every bird, for miscegenation, inbreeding of people considered to be of different races, and for Q531 Fragment 2, they defiled, they begot giants and monsters. The Kalbrin makes clear that it is woman, and woman alone, who is responsible for the two genetic defilements of the race of the children of God, for it is she who weakens and mates, first, with the yasling, then with the beasts of the forest. By defiling her race, she does herself a great disfavor, for the children of God regard woman as the equal of man whereas the children of men use her as a sex slave and a chattel, which over time becomes the norm throughout the human race. Over thousands of generations and endless intermingling, distinctions between the species gradually disappear and the resulting mixture becomes the shorter-lived, disease-prone human beings we are now. The Kalbrin gives an interesting explanation of lengthy lifespans recorded in the Old Testament and the Sumerian king list. The earth is destroyed by fire. Man survives, but he is not the same. The sun is not as it was before, and a moon disappears. A subsequent destruction splits apart the eastern and western mountains so that they stand up in the sea, and tilts the northern land mass over on its side. The lands of the little people Homo floresiensis, discovered in 2003 on the Indonesian island of Flores, the giant's giant human skeletons were found in ancient Greece see Adrian Mayer's The First Fossil Hunters, Dinosaurs, Mammoths, and Myth in Greek and Roman Times. Giant bones have been discovered all over the world, especially in North America. Most recently, skeletons of nine-foot men are being found near Borhomi in Georgia, Caucasus, and near Colliery in Sardinia, the necklace ones in the land of marshes and mists are all destroyed. The late Professor Ilya Vikwa with giant-sized bones from 2008 expedition in Georgia, Source, Homo floresiensis reconstructed, Source, legendary necklace man from a race which Greek geographer Strabo called the Blem Mice, Source. One the late Professor Ilya Vikwa with giant-sized bones from 2008 expedition in Georgia, Source. Two Homo floresiensis reconstructed, Source. Three legendary necklace man from a race which Greek geographer Strabo called the Blem Mice, Source. In the intensely cold age that follows, human beings survive by hiding in caves. They are terrorized by giant beasts until, following heavenly rebellion and turmoil, a cataclysm hardens the face of the earth and turns the beasts to stone. Subsequently the earth is destroyed by the flood of Atuma, then by the deluge. The Kalbrin's pre-deluge account contains details linking it to the story of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch. The names Sisuda and Sherepek in the deluge story lead me to think that the Kalbrin's version of the flood story is the earliest Sumerian version. Incidentally, the Kalbrin states that the great ship comes to rest upon Cardo. Sumerian name for the land of the Kurds, in the mountains of Ashta, against Nishim, Nisibin slash Nisibin, in the land of God. 9. Full-scale replica ark built in the Netherlands to Old Testament specifications by Johann Hubers, Ref. People Pets. Full-scale replica ark built in the Netherlands by businessman Johann Hubers, Ref. People Pets. The deluge story is followed by a lengthy version of the Gilgamesh story with a hero called Hermain Tar. When Osiris slash Yusir the Great One comes from the west with the people of light seeking refuge in Egypt after the destruction of his own land, Ramakwai of the Seven Cities, land of Copper Edgar Cayce's Ramaki, he finds a population living in holes in the ground, following the cataclysm, 
a plague has wiped out all the adult population and with it all knowledge of basic living skills. The remaining population includes men who were blood kindred with the beasts of the forest or with fowl or with serpent, who dwelt together according to their kinship, and were divided thereby. Osira teaches the lost generation how to grow corn, to spin and to carve stone, as well as writing and numbers. But when he tries to teach the people about God, they do not understand him, so he invents signs and simple tales, the first ever myths, to help them understand. He tells them that when he dies, the son will become their adoptive parent in his place. He is much beloved by the common people. Osira has brought with him from Ramakwai amazing technology, the sacred eye and the fire stone which gathers the light of the sun forms of knowledge lost to us now, just as we have lost the rituals of seashells and the song of the stars, above all, he brings with him, out of his people's transparent temples, the light that shines when darkness falls without being lit. Osira is not like other men. Wearing robes of black linen and a red headdress, he has the likeness of a god and his bones are not as those of others. When eventually he dies in the manner of men, he leaves behind him a flourishing civilization. Later, wise men come to Egypt from Zader Edgar Cayce's Posidia, another land recently destroyed. They are great astronomers, they reject the idea of the sun as a god, and they have a unique mummification practice of covering the bodies of their dead with potter's clay and leaving it to harden. In his 2013 book The Ancient Giants Who Ruled America, The Missing Skeletons and the Great Smithsonian Cover-Up, Alan J. Denworst reproduces among his hundreds of newspaper clippings one from the Syracuse Daily Standard dated July 23, 1897 which reports not only the finding of an old copper spear with an incredibly fine 10-inch point, but also a 9-foot skeleton embalmed in some kind of dried cement. The journalist added, Archaeologists believe that at some prehistoric time the country surrounding Mora was densely inhabited by a race of people who were much further advanced in civilization than the Indians. On April 19, 1915, H. E. Davis of the El Paso Herald reported that an ancient eight-foot skeleton discovered near Silver City was encased in baked mud, indicating that encasing the corpse in mud and baking it was the mode of embalming. Under the twin influences of Osira and the wise men of Zadar, Egypt becomes a land of two peoples, two streams of wisdom and two hierarchies of gods. A few Egyptians learn how to move outside their everyday consciousness to glimpse what happens beyond death and how, by long spiritual preparation and enduring the awfulness of the false death, the strongest among them can become fearless twice-borns. It is the wise men of Zadar who build the great guardian Rakama the Sphinx, and the great house of the hidden places which once contained the womb of rebirth used by the twice-born the Great Pyramid. They also build the Temple of the Radiant Ones at Giza the Valley Temple, and they write on a great stone above the entrance, from the children of God to the children of men. Behold, we found you in bondage to mortal bodies and bestowed upon you the gift of everlasting life. The description of the Temple of the Radiant Ones many pillared and walled about, fits what we now call the Valley Temple. Robert Temple says in his book Egyptian Dawn, once you go through one of the doors of the Valley Temple, you are in one of the granite entrance halls, which are very high. A niche made of granite very far above head height looks down on you, no one knows whether it contained a statue, or what its purpose was. Over subsequent centuries, Egyptian scribes wonder where their motherland could have been. They consider all the geographical options where strange races live, and speculate whether the motherland might have been Ramakwai, Zadar or some earlier civilization. The Book of Origins states unequivocally that their cradle land was Crocassus the Caucasus. Pliny the Elder in his Naturalis Historia derives the name Caucasus from the Scythian Crocassus ice shining, white with snow. In August 2011, scientists at the Zurich DNA Genealogy Center IGENEA reconstructed the DNA profile of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. Results showed that he belonged to a genetic profile group known as haplogroup R1b1a2, to which 70% of British, 70% of Spanish and 60% of French men also belong. Roman Schals, director of the IGENEA Center, said, We think the common ancestor lived in the Caucasus about 9,500 years ago. 10. Pliny's Ice Shining Caucasus Mountains, Ref Arneman and .wordpress.com Pliny's Ice Shining Caucasus Mountains, Source Egypt prospers. Its rulers put spirituality and duty to their subjects above all else. Their sacred knowledge is carefully written down and preserved alongside the earliest records brought to Egypt by Osira and the wise men of Zadar. These sacred texts are stored in four secret geographical locations. But the land also suffers wars, calamities, and cataclysms. One 18th dynasty scribe looks back at his civilization and writes, My land is old. 120 generations have passed through it since Osira brought light to men. 
four times the stars have moved to new positions and twice the sun has changed the direction of his journey. Twice the destroyer has struck earth and three times the heavens have opened and shut. Twice the land has been swept clean by water. 11. The destroyer at work in Jose Vega's painting Parting of the Red Sea, Ref. The Dark Side of the Force. The destroyer at work Jose Vega's painting Parting of the Red Sea, Ref. The Dark Side of the Force. Throughout the Egyptian books nearly 30 references are made to the destroyer. The destroyer is also mentioned in Exodus 12:23. Jeremiah 48:8 and Job 15:21, an overwhelming destructive heavenly phenomenon that appears regularly every few thousand years and is so terrible as to be beyond man's understanding. Its appearance and behavior are described in detail, particularly during an account of the Israelite slave Exodus from Egypt. This is described from an Israelite viewpoint in the book of Exodus. See Manuscript 6. Chapter 12 verse 23 of the book of Exodus actually refers to God and the destroyer as separate entities. The El Arish steel marks the place of the whirlpool where the Egyptian chariots fought their last stand against the Israelites before being overcome by rocks and water. Details in the Qabran also tally with an ancient Egyptian text the Lament of Ippower. According to the Roman scholar Servius, information about the destroyer and its link with the Exodus could be found in the works of an Egyptian astrologer called Pedosiris, so this could well have been one of the Qabran's sources. The Latin author Pomponius Mela refers explicitly to Egyptian written sources for astronomical details which also appear almost word for word in the Qabran. Over and over, the Egyptian books prophesy the return of the destroyer, and their precise descriptions of the state of the world at the time of its return are not just a shrill millennial warning, but could well refer to our own time. Somehow Egypt survives these cataclysms. But as the centuries roll on, the country begins to weaken. The Egyptian religion has always been split in two into, on the one hand, the open religion of the common people and on the other, the secretive mysteries practiced by priests within the inner temples. Gradually Egypt becomes idealistically and spiritually lazy. At one point, a man called Setra conceives a plan to allow everyone to participate in the sacred mysteries hitherto reserved exclusively for the worthy ones among men. He gathers together a following of his own and promises them knowledge of all things sacred. What follows is strife most grievous that is in some way connected to the house of the hidden places the Great Pyramid. A scroll described in the Qabran as extremely ancient says that the twin powers drawn down entwined about themselves and grew ever stronger. Even as waters are dammed to be drawn upon, so was the united power built up into a reserve of force. A storehouse of strange energy was prepared. Christopher Dunn suggests in the Giza power plant that the ancient Egyptians might well have developed their own power system. The same scribe aims some strong criticism at the establishment of the land, O oh Egypt you have turned to gods that are not but the spirits of men returned to dwell in wood and stone. The ears of rulers are closed to words of wisdom, the doors of their hearts are bolted against truth. Egyptians still remember from their past that Osira and the priests from Zadar had astonishing powers and could even bring a form of life back into a dead body so that the soul might commune with the living. But their memories are vague, and since their priests no longer know how to perform such supernatural feats, they reason that preserving a dead body from decay might mean one day it could be restored to life. So they developed the art of mummification and charge for it. A scribe writes, Priests grow fat on riches bestowed for the preservation of the body, while those who speak of the preservation of the soul are tormented. Religious practice lapses into empty ritual. An attempt by Pharaoh Nabihetan Akhenaten to introduce a new sun religion comes to nothing, partly because of his own spiritual inadequacy, partly because of his epileptic fits, and partly because of his licentious behavior culminating in an incestuous relationship with his daughter which appalls everyone who hears of it. On October 26, 2014, BBC One's program Tutankhamun, The Truth Uncovered made several surprising claims. Recent CT scans and DNA tests have proved conclusively that Amenhotep III and his son Akhenaten were congenital epileptics and that Tutankhamun's many medical conditions, necrosis of the bones, club foot, malformed body, were the result of an incestuous relationship between Akhenaten and his sister. Colburn readers already knew about the epilepsy, in the book of manuscripts Akhenaten's fits are described in detail. But the Colburn states that Akhenaten's incestuous relationship was not with his sister it was with his daughter Merit Aden. It also says that two sons were born of his incestuous relationship. If the mummy of Merit Aden were to be DNA tested, we think it might show she was the mother of Tutankhamun and maybe of Sminker too. Test Statue of Akhenaten kissing his daughter Merit Aden, source. However, some still follow the old spirituality and preserve the ancient written knowledge passed down from Osira and the wise men of Zadar. A few Egyptians still go through the long preparation and immense ordeal of becoming twice born, 
but the old ways are increasingly frowned on by the majority. The people who practice them are ostracized. Two of the individuals mentioned by name are Pasinsa. Two funeral cones for an Egyptian called Pasinsa can be seen in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, and Panyobis. The sarcophagus of a Panyobis is in the Natural History Museum of Santiago, Chile. Other 18th Dynasty Egyptians whose works appear in the Kalbrin include Hapu High Priest of Amon during the reign of Hatshepsut, Senmet architect and government official, whose masterpiece was the mortuary temple complex for Hatshepsut and a female poet called Nefertari who might have been Ramesses II's daughter. Eventually these people's lives and the records they treasure are thought to be in grave danger. Knowing from past prophecy that their spiritual path lies in another land away to the north, the guardians of the sacred writings make a crucial decision. They leave Egypt, smuggling out a complete set of their writings, and go into exile. In May 2014 the skeleton of Kenemon, royal steward and foster brother to Pharaoh Athamosis II, was discovered. He is mentioned in the Kalbrin as one of those who leave Egypt. From archaeology we know that Ethmosis II had prepared a splendid tomb for Kenemon in Thebes which, when it was excavated, was found to be defaced, not a single image of him had survived the chisel attacks of his time. The Kalbrin suggests a sound reason for Kenemon's disgrace. Funeral Cone of Pasinsu, Source Funeral Cone of Pasinsu, Source The narrative continues. It has now become the story of the Sons of Fire, whose quest is to guard the Great Book of Egypt and find a safe home for themselves. The Sons of Fire are said to be highly skilled metal workers of Tyre, people of the Twin Cities Tyre and Sidon. Knowing they must go north, the Sons of Fire make their scrolls and metal plate texts watertight, load their provisions and set sail. But the place where they try to settle first and build a city is full of wild men, it is on the edge of the known world and the now destroyed land of mists and kingdom of the trees, where the dampness causes sickness and many of them die. After some years, knowing they will all die if they stay there any longer, the Sons of Fire set sail again northwards. They come across a group of Greek refugees from Troy and travel together. Eventually they arrive on the south coast of Britain. At this time, post-Ice Age Britain is still an empty land inhabited by painted men, small, tattooed picks, and a few six cubit slash nine foot giants survivors of the cataclysm that destroyed most of the race of giants. The Trojans sail on to Dodona later called Dodonesi in Holland Shed's Chronicle, now known as Totnes with their leader Cory News and after slaying the few remaining giants still living in Belharia St. Michael's Bay. The same giants of great temples and they are six cubits tall the migrants settle in what is now Cornwall. Several different languages are known to have been spoken in Britain at this time. The Legendary Cory News and Gog Magog the Giant, Source The Legendary Cory News and Gog Magog the Giant, Source The Sons of Fire move on and settle in a place named after a brave barbarian fighter called Cluth this might well be the Clyde Valley in Scotland. They later move not far distant and settle by the waters of Glaive Glasgow, where they set up a temple the temple area of Glasgow, and establish their own distinctive way of life, adding laws to their existing books. The Sons of Fire have brought with them five great book boxes containing 132 scrolls and five ring-bound volumes, known as the Greater Book of the Egyptians and the Lesser Book of the Egyptians. These books include The Book of the Trial of the Great God The Sacred Register The Book of Establishment the Book of Magical Concoctions The Book of Songs The Book of Creation The Book of Destruction The Book of Tribulation The Great Book of the Sons of Fire, which contains, among other texts, the Book of Secret Lore and the Book of Decrees. What we are left with, centuries later, are the Book of Creation, the Book of Gleanings, the Book of Scrolls, the Book of the Sons of Fire, the Book of Manuscripts and the Book of Morals and Precepts. Nothing is known about the Book of the Trojans, once listed with the other books. The Story in the Celtic Books Celtic texts make up the second part of the Kalbrin. The scribes writing them are clearly impressed by the Egyptian books which they have copied and preserved, for they try to set out the ancient history of Britain in the same format as the Egyptian texts. The Celtic texts do not mention the Egyptian books or their whereabouts, but they do refer to certain treasures stated in the Egyptian books to have disappeared which seem to correspond to items brought to Egypt by Osiret. The heart of Britain is the moon chalice which was brought here by the hands of the chief of the Cassini. He came shipborne to Ravenia Richborough, in Kent, which is by the Mount of Lud once an island off Dunkirk, covered by rising sea levels in the late Roman period, against Ardmoal. Passing in Struck, he came to Itin ancient name for the new forest in Hampshire where he hid the treasure in Trebthu. It was not captured, as men say, nor could it decay. In the fullness of time it came to Cargwin Winchester in Hampshire, once called Caer Gwintakike. 
there it was kept secure with the grail stone and the ever-virgin vessel which brought down the rays of the sun. Thus it was that these treasures of Egypt came to Britain. This was the secret of Britain. The Celtic books comprise The Book of Origins or Feral Book Included in this book is an important retelling of the flood tale brought by early immigrants to Britain known as the Wildland Cultivators who come from Crocassus, the Caucasus. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle begins its history of Britain by saying, the first inhabitants were the Britons, who came from Armenia, and first peopled Britain southward. In ancient times Armenia was a huge kingdom whose territory included half of what is now Turkey plus areas to the south and east it also describes the indigenous peoples living in Britain when the first immigrants settled there. The flood tale in this book mentions not one, but two ships of flood survivors, a ship with a house on it, and the brim kofer brim and kofer each having a specific, now obsolete meaning brim equals the flood and kofer equals the ark of the flood, in the 1937 Oxford English Dictionary. The Book of the Silver Bow This has among its writings some prophetic text about the return of the frightener corresponding to prophesies about the destroyer in the Egyptian books, but with some other details. The Book of Lucius The Book of Wisdom the Britain Book. Two chapters of this book contain an apocryphal gospel of the life of Jesus, stating that he was not divine and giving details such as that he and his disciples would sometimes go down to Tyre to work on Joseph of Arimathea's ships. There is a full description of how Joseph of Abramatha slash Idwin slash Eliad slash Eliad Joseph of Arimathea and his companions arrive in Britain, Joseph's subsequent dealings with the Druids and King Caratus slash Caractacus, and the rocky progress of early Christianity in Britain over the first few hundred years including the persecution of early Christians by the Romans. I've done my best to decode Joseph's route from place names provided in the Celtic books. In the books of Britain it is written, Iliad Joseph of Arimathea came seaborne in a ship of Tarsus Tartessos on the Spanish peninsula from across the sea of Wicta Sea of Vectes, setting up at Raphania Richborough, Kent in the land of the Wains land of the Celtic chariots. From thence to the river Torrent River Trent which flows between the kingdom of Albany and the kingdom of Cory Cornwall, Albany being the land between the Isan iron working area to the east, and the Ictaisksa or trading town of Exeter to the west. Passing Ivern Charmouth and Insel's Louis Island south of the Cathy Bellin, and then past Dins Olin St. Michael's Mount to take water at the town where ships traded standing at the foot of the Red Cliff between the two white ones Cluga Head, Perrin Porth, around the extreme of the world to the northern Ictaisksa or trading town of Caerleon on Usk in Siluria. Here, they were unwelcome, but were permitted to take water and wood and to trade for meat and grain. Sailing thence towards the rising sun, they came to the place beyond Sabrin River Severn called Summerland Somerset. St. Michael's Mount Belharia Dins Olin, legendary home of the last remaining giants in Britain, covered at high tide, Ref. Y.W., Pre-Roman Slipway, Wharf, and Quay at Caerleon Usk, Ref. Y.W., Ancient Freshwater Well on Roman Foundation at Caerleon Usk, the Northern Icta, Ref. Y.W., Goldcroft Common, last of the nine trading commons at Caerleon on Usk. 1 St. Michael's Mount Belharia Dins Olin, legendary home of the last remaining giants in Britain, covered at high tide, Ref. Y.W. 2 Pre-Roman Slipway, Wharf, and Quay at Caerleon on Usk, Ref. Y.W. 3 Ancient Fresh Water Well on Roman Foundation at Caerleon on Usk, the Northern Icta, Ref. Y.W. 4 Goldcroft Common, last of the nine trading commons at Caerleon on Usk. The Britain book includes a detailed description of the lake village near what is now Glastonbury, now eastward and to the north there was a lake, and between this and the Isle of Departure there was a swamp land and there was a village of houses that stood out above the water, and the moon maidens and moon matrons who served the dead dwelt there, in models in archaeology, Methuen, 1971, David L. Clark states that this lake village clearly contained areas of specialized activities and Structures occupied only by women. The following text links the Celtic books to early British history. Joseph Idwin was related to a Valak whose kingdom bordered that of Arvaragus, through Anna the Unfaithful. He converted Claudia Rufina, the daughter of Carato previously called Gladys, who married Pudens, a Roman, and had a daughter Pudentia. In his 28th year, Carato was betrayed to the Romans by Arisia, queen of Briantis. He married Genuissa, daughter of Claudius, to bind the peace agreement. In his 1968 book The Drama of the Lost Disciples, George F. Jowett identifies the ruins beneath the present-day church of St. Pudentiana in Rome with the Britannic palace in which Caratus slash Caractacus lived while under house arrest with his daughter Gladys slash Claudia and Pudens, whose daughter Pudentia helped the early Christians, the church was named after her. I have visited the church and glimpsed the remains of the palace through a grill at the side of the church, 
though the collapse remains are too dangerous to Ventu. Gladys, sister of Caridu, married Aulus Plautius, a Roman commander. Caridu slash Caractacus held an estate in Siluria and was made work if when Guide Rias, son of Kimbelin Symboline slash Sinfilin slash Kimbelinus, king late 1st century BC early 40s AD was slain by a slingshot near the river Thames. In the year 59 of our Lord, the British rose up under Wodaka Budika, the horse fighter, who died nearly three years later when Golga is became Warkif. The Kaldi The unnamed cleric who compiled the Kaldi the Gospel of John of Luna says at the start that he is uniting in one narrative the diverse accounts brought to these shores by the Kaldi, in the days of battle glory, when the mantle of Hurthu descended upon Inhok Karedu, led by the wise Eliad. Joseph of Arimathea He calls his book the Book of John the Enlightened of God and the Book of the Nasorines and the Illuminated Ones. He sends greetings to his brothers in Doiva, the Koferals at Karimba, he says that he and they have all been cast out. He states that they are opposed by cunning people who have the support of the dark strangers. Let us who are homeborn stand as one in all things, and not least in belief, for we are surrounded by dark bearded men with strange ways. The scribe goes on to say that hundreds of wonderful books, the life work of diligent hands, have been used to heat the flesh pots, and there is a constant searching of all which does not accord with foreign beliefs. Since there are many versions, I have taken it upon myself to prepare this one for you from the writings saved in flight. Pitifully few are the books salvaged from the great conflagration and brought out under our gowns. I have faithfully copied the accounts of that John whom we call Numa, who knew our earthly father, touching on events of his times according to the books which have been written and left to us. It has been suggested by a Colburn reader that the great conflagration might have been the burning of the Library of Alexandria in 3 RD 4th century AD. The cleric clearly combines Druidic and Christian beliefs, I am one who can overcome the distinctions between Jesus and Assuers, reconciling the crystal virgin with mystic motherhood. I can place the clear moon-filled chalice beside the golden blood-filled cup. I can combine the stargird circles of eternity with the lowly cross, and the defeated suffering son with the victorious battle-inspiring fighter. What distinguishes the Chaldee from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is that it contains far more material, including many biographical details not found elsewhere. For instance, there is much more information about John the Baptist slash John of the Wilderness which, we are told, was brought to these shores by Aristolas, author of a chapter in the Britain book. We are told that Jesus' mother Mary was a virgin only in the sense that she had once been a virgin pledged to God in the temple by her father, that the wise men from the east were men of Sastera, wise in the books of heaven, and of Nimrod who carried the cross of fire, that Jesus, described as Jesus the Nasorine, was brought up in Genesareth and trained to make plows, that at the time his father died he was working as a craftsman among the Kenites, that he was a man of long silences. And many thought him strange, that he was not the only healer in his country there were others, too, that he did not always heal a person, for in some it created a disturbance, while many were not cured because this would have done them more harm than good even that he loved boats and swimming. In the Chaldee the details surrounding his death and resurrection imply that he did not die on the cross. Above all, the Chaldee shows how Jesus' teachings were grafted onto Druidic and Celtic beliefs to create the Celtic Church of Britain which preceded the Roman Church by several hundred years. Letter found in an old copy of the Colburn. At the back of the 1994 New Zealand hardback edition of the Colburn there is reproduced a note found inside an old copy of the Colburn. Signed by J.MCA it tells how the Colburn was brought back to light in the place known to them as Feudern, beyond the pool of Pantlin at Carclathan by way of Gwendwer in Wales. I have identified the village as Gwender, south of Bilthwells, the pool as Pantwylin, and the cairn as Sefnclod the only cairn out of 439 sites recorded in an archaeological field survey of that area, for the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales, which was described as disturbed. Sefnclod Cairn 2, ring-shaped bank in center with Pant Yllyn pool in background, source. The writer remembers his grandfather saying that it was originally written in the old alphabet of 36 letters and that the books were stored in a tinker's budget box, the lid of which was not hinged but held with flanges and lifted off after being heated. Were a fragment written in the old alphabet to come to light, perhaps it would tell us that Ilo Morgan wasn't such a forger after all. If you want to find out what was inside the tinker's box, you'll just have to buy the original hardback version online. My database of archaeological and textual links is steadily increasing, I've only mentioned a few above, and there's almost certainly a book to be written. But first, I need help. I can't help thinking that someone somewhere out there might have remnants of the manuscripts maybe even a rusty shard of the bronze book. 
If anyone reading this article has any information which might help me further along the intriguing trail of the Cobrin and its provenance, please do get in touch via this website or write to me at vongcoelbrin at gmail.com. On a lighter note, I'll leave you with my favorite Celtic homily from the Britain book, Do Not Become a Griffin. Remember that, and you can't go wrong.